He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near you, your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. I want to welcome you to his story. Uh, today is March the 24th. I will be introducing uh, my co-host with us, uh, Lisa Varga. Welcome, Lisa. Um, it, here is uh, our next episode of his story. Uh, we were going to have Kevin and Sam Sorbo, but Kevin had a, a, a conflict. And um, so Kevin, is, Kevin and Sam are going to reschedule with us. I think we're going to pre-tape that next week. But what a great Sunday we had to have them come on. Our conversation on Sunday, how that led to our guest today. Yes, this is so exciting. And you know what? God works everything out. And that does happen in the business. You know, Kevin and Sam, something comes up. They have these emergencies. Um, but thank God we've got people like our next guest that are here with us today uh, that stepped in at the last minute. And you know what? Someone needs to hear their messages today. So this is very exciting. And uh I'm, I'm really excited to have both of these guests with us here today. It's such a small world, too. I, it was amazing. We are just a Sunday. You know, we had a conference call with somebody else. They introduced us to Nick. Nick tells us that he knows Abraham. I'm like, Abraham is, knows Trudy, and he does. He was on our Sunday praise music that day. It's so small world. Yeah, God's bringing everybody together. Small. <laughs> a really small world. Yeah. That's what God does, though. He connects everybody. <laughs> he does, and he's doing it quicker and quicker and quicker for the kingdom. So I'll let you introduce our two guests, um, and we have a special song, so I'll let you introduce that. Yes, yeah, so this is exciting. So we are on episode three, and we already have a musical guest that's going to open for us. Uh, today, obviously, we have Nick Searcy, so we're going to talk to Nick in a minute. But first, we are going to open it up with a song, uh, and the artist, his name is Abraham. And the name of the song he's going to be singing for us today is called Quiet Storm. So uh, sit back and have a listen and enjoy. Thanks, guys. This song is about... Um the enormous spiritual energy that is sweeping this planet right now. It's not visible and most can't perceive it, but the effects are astonishing. So it's called Quiet Storm. <laughs> Like a prayer 
Boa journée. As I cry, storm raging. As I cry, storm raging. As I cry, storm. Wow, your lyrics are so powerful as I'm listening to that. It, I mean, that's a story in itself. Um, let me ask you a question real quick. That, that was Abraham, by the way, um, and that was Quiet Storm. And I believe uh, Abraham is part of his glory praise music. Is that correct, Pastor? Yeah, he, he's been on our praise music the last two weeks. I believe he's going to be on again this Sunday. Amazing. And I, I believe we're going to have him on as a guest because yes. he's got part of the story. Um, Abraham, I don't know if you're still there or not. Yep. Um, but I was, I don't know if he is or if we've got Nick over there. We still have a Abraham. Abraham, you started playing at a very young age, I heard. Is that correct? And also tell us where you're from. I was born in uh, Southern Africa, South Africa. And um, fortunately for me, my, my family were. Um, artistic type, so they let me do my thing. You know, I started at about nine, picked up a guitar at nine and just never put it down again. I could hear the passion in your voice. This is something you love. And the, the lyrics, like I said, are unbelievable, um, especially for this time we're in right now. Um, where can people hear your music? Or you have a website where they can listen? I have a website, which is um, uh, Aubrey Van Stratton. Uh, Aubrey is short for Abraham. Okay. At the moment, it's A B R I Van Stratton, S T R A T E N dot net. Perfect. Yeah, you guys watching, go to that website, listen to his music. It's beautiful. I was listening to it last night, and um, there's some other amazing songs on there too. So thank you for showing Quiet Storm with us. And, and that was Abraham. Yep. So amazing. Uh, check him out, check his music out. Thank you so much. We have a musical guest. This yep. is. Wow, we're, we're moving up here on episode three. <laughs> That's right. And if they want to hear more of uh, Abraham, he'll be on the His Glory Sunday service this coming Sunday. So, Oh, great. Praise okay, God. yeah, tune in. Everybody. So do you want to enter? We're going to do run, before we introduce Nick, we're going to run a trailer to his last 
uh, d- documentary. Yeah, and let's say to the name of it, it's called America, America, God Shed His Grace on Thee. And this is a documentary film from Nick Searcy, and we're going to talk to Nick when we come back. But watch the trailer. It is incredible, and you're going to want to go out and watch the movie right after this. All right, cool. Hi, it's Nick Searcy. I'm, I'm calling for Congresswoman Omar. I was making the film about God in America. Well, do you know when she'll be in? Well, is her brother there or her husband or whatever? The death of, of, uh, uh, of religion in America is the death of America as we know it. There has been an attack on churches, on the freedom of churches, on the ability of people even to go into churches. We are in danger of forgetting God and the consequences are disastrous. It's because the Bible is the printed word of God. It provides a lot of the spiritual foundation of our nation. Ten Commandments right there on the building endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That proposition was radical. Point two, the truth that all men are created equally, and that is America. Yes, uh, I'm trying to reach President Trump. We've got a situation here. Um, that's, That's why I'm in the situation room. I really need him to be in this movie. You can tell him that it's going to be huge, that I make the best documentaries, all the other documentaries that are made are garbage. The Wuhan virus right now has been handed to the left on a platter because they are using that right now to silence people of faith. Government is, uh, in many ways, prohibiting the growth of the church. The reason that the left wants to get rid of God is so it would open the door for them to become many dictators. You know, sometimes when there's chaos, when there's pandemics, when there's riots, people think, where is God? And I think that God always manages to sort of reemerge. The assault on religion by, by statists who believe that the sole source of moral authority and good and possibility is the state, Religion has to go. When you try to remove God and create human beings to be their own God, it's guaranteed to be a bloodbath. And the only thing that can instruct us from actually indulging into that creation of a earthly hell is the Bible. The person who asked me for the cake that we were sued for the second time asked me to create a cake um, with Satan smoking marijuana. Um, Satan smoking marijuana? Yeah. (laughs) So that's not a cake that I'm going to create for anybody. Hello, is this uh, Vice President Biden's campaign headquarters? Yeah, I'd like to speak to uh, Vice President Biden. My name's Nick Searcy. I am a documentary filmmaker. I'm making a movie about God in America. Is, uh, is Joe there? Do you know where he is? Does he know where he is? We must have faith in God. Mark 11, 22, have faith in God. We live by the grace and mercy and forgiveness of God. If you're going to have a totalitarian government, you got to make the government of God. Almighty God, once again, your humble servants come before you to ask for thy grace and thy mercy. And this Constitution is intended for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. We pray for the leadership of this nation. And we pray for those that want to destroy this nation, that they will not be successful because it does not represent you, God Almighty. In the name of thy Son, we pray. And in your precious name, dear God, amen. Can you pull us all close to the Holy Ghost and keep us strong? We need your light, we need your love to heal the world you made. And save us now in our darkest hour with your amazing grace. Earth to God.
Absolutely amazing, 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 amazing. Oh, wow, I felt the chills of that. This is a must see. Before, Lisa, I have you introduce Nick. I just gotta tell you, this is a God thing working because I was watching a show, a movie that Nick was in, and I told one of my board members that was watching it with me, I love that Nick, he's, he's, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, he's filled with God, I, I gotta meet him. And then two days later, I get a call from somebody that is in the media business, and he brought, brings Nick's name up, and I just thought, well, that's kinda <laughs> weird. And then we're sitting on a conference call on Sunday, and all of a sudden, boom, here comes Nick. And God worked things pretty quickly. So really, really neat stuff. And for yeah. him to know Abraham of all people, it's God is connecting everybody. It's amazing. I know. It really is amazing. And I remember you saying that, too, when we were on our call yep. and how everybody knew other people, you know, within the circles that we were all involved in. So there is something happening right now where, you know, God's working yep. and, and there's powerful things happening. Speaking of powerful, this film is powerful. This film is so important right now. Um, and I'm gonna just introduce Nick because I want him to come on and talk about it. Uh, so um, Nick Searcy is our guest today and uh, welcome Nick. <laughs> Hi everybody, great to be here. Great to have you. Before we go into all this, I always do research on the guests that come on and oh. I'm amazed at how many films you have been in. I looked on IMDb because, you know, that's what we do in the business. Um, over 130 TV shows and films. That's quite a career you have. I mean, he's been in things. I, I, I just I listed just a couple. Thunder Alley, American Gothic, 911, Chicago Med, Murder One, Nash Bridges, Seven Days, Rodney, Stolen Innocence, Intelligence, Movies are Castaway, One Hour Photo, Runaway Jury, The Assassination of Richard, Richard Nixon, The Ugly Truth, Greater, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, In the Shape of Water. Could you be in any more films? And the answer is yes. And now you're directing them, uh, producing them, starring in them. You, uh, my friend, are quite uh quite the entertainer filmmaker and storyteller so i just had to introduce you and and tell people that you are amazing and you've been in in a lot of things so i'm sure everyone has seen you in something or another and uh, we're excited to see what you have next but let's talk about america america god shed his grace on thee because we just saw the trailer and the time right now for this film is perfect. Yep. So tell us about it. Well, thank you, Lisa. Uh, and thank you, Pastor. You know, it's a, I tell people every once in a while I get a job. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but lately I've sort of been uh, creating my own jobs. And uh, America, America, God Shed His Grace on Thee is a, a film that was commissioned by the Centennial Institute out of Colorado Christian University. And they wanted me to make a film about the relationship between the Bible and the Constitution, the founding of America, and how the relationship between God and America has changed or developed over the years, and basically how America got to the to the shape we're in now. And I, I told them when they commissioned me, it's like, uh, okay, I, I, I've never made a documentary before. I'm willing to give it a shot. But are you okay if it's also a comedy? Because that's kind of what I do. <laughs> so, <laughs> So and, and it turned out, you know, we were we were definitely led by God through the making of that movie, and uh, and it's uh, it's not only informative and it's powerful, but it's also pretty funny. So uh, that that helps us get the message across, and uh, and it helps even with the young people that watch it. They're kind of uh, they're kind of forced to absorb some of the information because they're waiting for another joke. So uh, it's, uh, it, it, it really was a wonderful experience, and, and it's led to uh, other things. I'm getting ready to make another one, kind of a sequel to it. So. Oh, you know, and I love that there's comedy because everything in the world right now, I, I mean, we need a little laughter. So I'm glad that you sprinkled that in there, but you still have such a powerful message that this is about. And I love that it's, you know, this is what happens when you try to take God out of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and you told that story beautifully and, and people need to see this. Um, I have a couple questions about the film. Sure. How long did it take you to film it? Like, was this over? And this was your first one. I didn't realize that it was a, your first documentary. Well, I'd, I've made I've directed feature films before. I directed the movie Gosnell that came out in 2018 as well. The, the movie about the uh, the abortion doctor in Philadelphia that was convicted of murder. 
Yeah. <clears throat> but this was the first documentary and uh, it was made to replace the Western Conservative Summit, which they have every year. And last year, of course, they didn't want to have a live summit because they couldn't gather people because yeah. of the virus. And so they, they made this film in, you know, replacing the live conference with, with the film. It took us, um, I hesitate to tell people how long it took us because they'll think that that's normal. And then that's how long they need to give me to make a movie. But we made that movie in four months. That's amazing. That's yeah. amazing for a documentary. Usually it takes years. Yeah. And we, you know, we, we, we were definitely led by God. I think in a, in a, in a, in a movie like that, especially you, you kind of a documentary, it seems like you, you figure out what the film's about while you're shooting it because mm -hmm. you go in with these expectations and, but you know, you, you base the film on what you get, you know, from the people you interview and the things that happen to you while you're doing the film. So we found in the process of making this movie that it really was a film about religious liberty because America's religious liberties were under attack and still are. And that's, that really, and that also is why America was founded. Yep. They came here in pursuit of religious liberty. So we realized kind of in the editing room after we saw, or maybe sort of partially through shooting that, uh, that the movie that we were making was really about religious liberty. Yeah. You, uh, I mean, you did a lot in this movie. So what were all the, uh, how many hats did you wear? I mean, I know we know you're in it because we saw the trailer, mm -hmm. but did you have, I mean, what else did you do on this film? Everything? <laughs> I, I produced it. My friend Chris Burgard directed it. He and I have worked together before in the past and, uh, and I, you know, did all the interviews and wrote all the all the equipment in it. I, you know, I tell people I, I did all my own stunts in that movie. I, I wrote, <laughs> did you wrote get hurt on anything? <laughs> I rode a horse, a motorcycle, and an electric scooter. In the movie. <laughs> and the most dangerous thing was the electric scooter. That's the only thing I fell <laughs> off of. Wow. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's funny. Um, where can we watch this? I know you. it's on your website um, or where is it streaming? So tell us where we can see this. Right now it's up on a website at shedhisgrace.com. Okay. Uh, shedhisgrace.com. You can download it there and buy a DVD. And uh, we are right now in negotiations with Salem Now, which is the company that released uh, Larry Elder's last film, Uncle Tom and some other movies. And, uh, they are going to add it to their website probably bef right before Easter so that it'll be reach a lot more people and be available um, nationwide. But right now, if you wanted to get it right now, you, you certainly can at shedhisgrace.com. Okay. What was the filmmaking experience as you were involved in it? I mean, did you, I, I, you had quite a few amazing guests that you interviewed for that. But did anything happen along the way? Do you have any God stories about, you know, the, the process of making the film? Well, one of them, I mean, there's so many. There really are so many. Yeah. Herman Cain was an old friend of both Chris's and mine. Chris had worked on his campaign. I had made an ad for Herman's campaign, endorsed him in 2012, which really helped my career in Hollywood, as you might imagine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in the course of setting up all these interviews and we, we wound up interviewing Mr. Kane three days before he went into the hospital, and it was his last interview. And during the time that we were there, I had reached out to some friends of mine, uh, you know, and it, we were always looking for interesting people that might want to be in the film. And the real, uh, one of the biggest God things that happened was, the, uh, was Ambassador Andrew Young consenting to appear in the, in the movie. Uh, he's, Andrew Young marched with Dr. King, he was the ambassador to the UN during Jimmy Carter's uh, administration, but he's a, he's a pastor. He, he's always considered himself a minister first. And when he agreed to be in the film, I, I can't tell you how much it enriched it because not only did it make it somewhat bipartisan because Andrew Young is a Democrat, uh, but his, his stories are just amazing. And the things that he shares in the movie are I think some of the most powerful things in the film, the, the story he tells about um, about growing up and and next near, near a uh, uh, the the headquarters of the Nazi Party, and his his father and him having to walk past the headquarters of the Nazi Party when he was young. Just the way he explains how his father 
taught him to let God guide him through those things. And God, God guided him through the rest of his life too. And it guided Martin Luther King. That's one of the things in the film. We, we talk about Martin Luther King as being a Christian minister, which is even the public schools that teach, teach about Dr. King, they minimize that. Yeah. They minimize the fact that he was led by the spirit. And we wanted to bring that out because Christianity and, and his faith in Jesus Christ is what led his movement. And as Andrew Young says, that's what made it successful. That's why he succeeded was because he was led by God. Yeah, that's powerful. Um, what do you want people to take away from this film after they see it? I mean, what, what's your goal for this? You know, I want them to uh, I want people to take away from this film that that uh, why this country was founded and why God is important to the country. Herman Cain says it really, really well. And the thing about his interview in the film, you can really feel how much he loves this country and, and how much God has led him as well. I think the thing that that I most want people to take away is that that this country has religious underpinnings. And as Herman Cain said, it, it was a belief the Constitution guarantees you a right to choose your own creator, to believe in your own creator, a creator of any kind. So that it's not it's not necessarily a totally Christian nation. It is a nation that is founded on the fact that we are created by a divine being and that we have a divine spark in our lives. No matter what religion you practice, that is true. And I think that's one of the things that makes it more universal. And I just, I really want people to take away from the film that a belief in a a higher power, a divine spark that lives in all of us is essential for America to survive. I love that. Um, what is your background? Tell us about your upbringing and, and your faith. I mean, you're obviously passionate about this. So let's let's go back to uh, when you were younger. Where did we start? Have you always been a believer? Have you always had faith? Take us on your journey. Well, in the film, I talk about it a little bit. <clears throat> There's a section where I talk about when I was a kid, I kind of thought I wanted to be a preacher because a lot of my uncles were, were Baptist ministers and I I spent a lot of time going to tent revivals and gospel sings, and my first cousin was a uh, a gospel singer and that sort of thing. So it was always just a, a, it was ingrained into the fabric of my life from a very young age. And I think I first answered an altar call when I was six or seven years old. I went up to the altar, and I think my grandmother was a little bit annoyed because it made her stay longer at church than she wanted to. <laughs> You know, it, it's just been something that has been part of my life from as long as I can remember. And um, I was baptized again when my daughter was baptized when she was 11. I was rebaptized then. And uh, it's uh, it, that I just feel like God has always been with me. And I feel fortunate that I was born into a family where that was just part of our lives. It was not uh, not foreign to me uh, at any time. Well, and in a sense, you really are a pastor because when you have this platform, you have your own pulpit and it's Hollywood. Um, Let's talk about Hollywood for a minute. Thank God you have that faith and you had that upbringing because I lived in Hollywood. I know I know what you're going through right now. I don't live there anymore, Um, but it's tough living in a place where you are one of the few that have the beliefs and the faith that you do. So um, talk about your experience in Hollywood with us right now. Well, in some ways, it, it really, the, the faith has, has been a real comfort to me because, you know, I, I don't, I've never really been scared of kind of saying what I thought or being who I was. I tell the joke, like, you know, I, by the time I figured out I should keep my mouth shut a bit about being a Christian conservative, it's too late. And everybody, <laughs> everybody, it's out there. <laughs> yeah, and, but it, it really has, it, it's been, it's, it's been a comfort and it's been, um, it's allowed me to not th- take things personally. Like if, um, you know, if somebody says they, they don't want to work with me because of my political beliefs or because of uh, my religious beliefs, then, you know, I know that's not about me. That's that's about them, and and they're they're not the judge of me anyway. And uh, I probably wouldn't have a good experience working with them if that's if that's the way they feel. So, I've uh, I've been fortunate in that I've been able to uh, work in Hollywood for a, for a long time, almost thirty years, and I still continue to get 
the uh, the odd thing now and then, but I sort of feel like in the in the last part of my, you know, what time I have left, I want to spend my time making products and films and and uh, just just products that I believe in that that uh, express what I want to express. And uh, God's been good to me in that way too. And so many opportunities have been opening up for me. My wife said to me the other day. You should have been blacklisted long ago. You're doing a little bit better now than you have. <laughs> <laughs> See how that works? Yeah. <laughs> when God's on your side, nobody can be against you. So, uh, you know, I Hollywood is tough. But what you're doing, I think, is great because you're creating your own projects. You don't need Hollywood right now. You know, it was great. You have a huge list of credits of, you know, film and TV shows that you've done. But now you're in this place where you're creating your own content and you don't need them. So great. Uh, you know, what's next for you? Well, I think that, that what's happening in Hollywood is really, it's not just about me. It, it's Hollywood has kind of really destroyed its credibility with a huge part of, of a huge percentage of the American people. And, and also at the same time, the technology to make a film the the and the way films are delivered has been so democratized it's now kind of available to everybody and a person with an iphone can make a film in 4k that looks as good as anything hollywood can make mm -hmm. so i think it's time i've been working with a gentleman uh, named jason lair on a project named criado which is going to be a platform that is uh, a streaming platform that doesn't discriminate against christians or conservatives not necessarily a conservatives only channel but just one that doesn't you know cr discriminate against such people and and i think more and more hollywood we're going to split there's going to be a, a new hollywood hollywood's going to continue to do what they do and you know there's an audience for what they do but there's also an audience for what we do and i think that that's what's going to happen hollywood is no longer going to be the gatekeepers that keep us out of the marketplace we're going to find our own delivery system so that we can enter the marketplace. And I truly believe that, uh, you know, God's people will be the, the audience for the films that we want to make. And I think there's more of us than there are of them. Yes. Oh, yeah, I agree. And Pastor David, you let's talk about the new Hollywood. You and I have had this discussion plenty of times. And, you know, tell us about your take on that. Well, I had a prophetic word four years ago that seven pillars of society would come down, including Hollywood. And out of all seven pillars, there would be a, a remnant for God and his glory. And that's exactly what's happening throughout the United States today. Yeah. And you're right, Nick. I mean, more of these projects will come up and we're going to form our own Hollywood and there's going to be people that are going to come forward. And Criado is a great platform. And that's kind of how all of us are connected right now. We had this amazing call this last Sunday and Jason is wonderful, but Nick, I know of you because of Criado and talking with Jason, and um, I, I just think they're doing wonderful things over there, and I'm very excited for this new platform. I don't know if you want to talk a little more about that for people who aren't familiar with Criado or how they can get involved or you know where we can go to help and support it. Well, if you do a search for Criado Media, there's a website now that explains how you can get involved as an early subscriber. But in a nutshell, I, you know, I'm not I'm not the the perfect one to explain all the technical aspects of it because I'm just a I'm just a dumb actor at the end of the day, I'm not a <laughs> technician. Uh, but um, basically, the idea behind Criado is that we want to build a system that can't be attacked at the server level by you know our enemies like say china or amazon a lot of the a lot of like what happened to parlor and what happened to gab is that their servers were controlled by amazon so it was just easy for them to shut them off mm -hmm. they just flipped a switch parlor was gone and that's what we're trying to guard against with creado we want to make sure that we have built our own servers that are secure that are american servers and so that we can't be stopped so that they cannot cut us off like that Mm -hmm. And I think that's the big difference. That's that's what has to happen next. We have to build our own infrastructure so that we can build the delivery system that can't be nullified by the left. Yeah. And what's your involvement with Criado? Because you're kind of overseeing um, some things over there, right? 
I'm just the pretty face. <laughs> <laughs> You're the spokesperson. <laughs> You're the one. Every- <laughs> yeah, and then this is you know, this is I'm the best they could do. So. <laughs> But no, I'm just sort of helping. And, and you know what? Let me stop you there. If that that's a compliment to them, because we already know what you've done, and yeah. your heart is for Jesus, so they can't lose with that one. So they hit a home run. <laughs> yeah, I think that my involvement with them is mostly going to be at the beginning. I'm just more of a publicity seeker, kind of trying to help them raise money. But towards the end, once the thing is fully funded, I'm 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 hoping to be more of a almost like a studio head or, you know, at least involved in selecting the sort of projects that Criado will make, because that'll be the third phase of the Criado building. Criado is in the, after we get it built and we get it up and running, Criado is going to start making content for the site, much like Netflix does, much like Amazon does. So I'll be involved more in that aspect of it than I will be at the beginning. Yeah, that's so exciting. And here's a great platform for everything that you're doing. So any project that you have, here you go. There, yeah. you know, there's distribution right there. Um, let's talk about what what do you have coming up? Are you working on anything exciting now? Well, I'm sure you are, but share share with us well, what it is. Yeah, I'm making a sequel to the movie that uh, the the people who are funding it want me to deliver it by July the fourth. So <clears throat> I'm pretty. Uh, <laughs> this July, this July the fourth. Yeah, this July the fourth. What are you doing talking to us? You need to get back out there. <laughs> okay, get to work. <laughs> You've only got a few minutes left. I, I That's don't a have miracle. Time. That's but, a miracle. Yeah, we're working on that. And I'm going to, you know, that'll be, we'll go full bore into production on April, April 1st to finish that. But I also have a number of projects that I have uh, written, co-written with a, a friend of mine, Blake Ellis. One, the one that is closest to fruition and the one that's really closest to my heart is I'm, I'm making a movie called Where I'm Bound, which is about gospel quartet music mm. and, in the 60s. And because uh, I kind of grew up with that. And so did my friend who, who helped, who wrote the script with me. And, you know, gospel quartet, that's a very sexy subject. Hollywood doesn't know that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Tell us why. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's just a love story set in the backdrop of, of, of the gospel quartet music in the, in the 60s, which is during that period when Elvis was getting popular and Elvis was such a big uh, gospel music fan and, and, and Jesus was such a big part of Elvis's life as well. And it's sort of uh, the movie is about that time, moment in time where rock and roll started entering, started entering the gospel world, and uh, and it's a it's about a young piano player who has kind of a foot in both camps. He's kind of grown up with gospel music, but he also loves Jerry Lee Lewis and Little Richard and all this. And it's about him bringing that style of music into the gospel world and uh, the the tension that it creates there and. Uh, and it's also it's 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 a movie that it's the kind of movie I really want to make, which is I want to make movies about Christians that are not necessarily classified as faith based films, because Hollywood uses that moniker, I think, to sort of as a signal. They're like telling people this is a faith based film, which means if you're not a Christian, don't watch it. Yeah. And this is only for Christians. And we're going to see if we can make a little money off those dumb Christians by making these faith-based films. I think that's what the studios think about it. And I want to make a movie that kind of, uh, in a certain way, maybe sneaks up on them a little more. You know, you kind of slip in the the message and make a really great story that, of course, is about people of faith, but it's not necessarily just a sermon or something. Just, a, a, you know, it's, it's, it's a story first, and the message will come in the story but it won't come in, in, in an obvious form. That makes I sense. I love that. I, and you know what? That is so true because not everyone is a Christian. Not everyone is a believer. So mm-hmm. we need to make films that everyone can watch. And you're right. Plant those seeds in there and sprinkle that through it. Uh, some of the most powerful like films that I've seen that have a Christian message, but it's not marketed that way, um, really maybe i mean one of them for example and this was years ago do you remember the movie the devil's advocate yes if yeah. you've seen that one i mean you know not for everybody rated r i didn't know what it was i'm like oh you know great I, I, let's let's see this film but the message behind that is very powerful so if you're talking about films like that that the whole world can see but at the end of that film you know wow every choice you make in life uh has an effect on 
everything. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and not just that film. I, don't, I mean, there's tons and tons of films like that, but I see where you're going and I love that. You know, we have our Christian films. That's great. Faith friendly films. Um, but we need more films like what you're talking about. So I think that's wonderful. I'm glad you're going to do that. One of the examples I always go to is The Blind Side. Um, yes. and the Blind Side as a film that that was very Christian in its uh, in its message, but not necessarily marketed that way. You know, it sold it, it, it was sold as a, a story of compassion and an athletic athletic triumph and that sort of thing. But yeah. and but the message comes through. And I think that also is why the film was so popular. Usually those films, if you do them right, the, a lot of people want to see that. A lot of people are ready to receive that message. Yeah, they want to feel good message. It's like, and everybody loves the underdog. I mean, that was a great film with a great story. I'm excited to see your story about the uh, gospel quartet. Um, what are you doing? Did you write it? Are you going to produce it? What Can you tell us the role that you're going to play? Well, I wrote it with uh, my, my partner, Blake Ellis, uh, my writing partner, and I'm going to direct it. And it looks like I'm producing it. I didn't want to, but I'm going to have to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but that, that's <laughs> like... All- I kind of went into all this, uh, really, I started directing. Uh, my first film I directed was in 1998. And uh, it was so much work that I just said, I want to go back and do that little acting job I had for a few years. That was a great <laughs> job. But then as Gos- when Gosnell came up as a, as a possibility, I said, yeah, I want, to, I want to direct again. And then after directing that movie, I, I really decided that that's really what I want to focus on in the, uh, the, the years I have left me. So yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking to direct not only the gospel quartet movie, I have a couple of other things that I'm working on. One's a, a, a movie that I'm, uh, slated to direct, uh, about the first battle that America won in the Re- revolutionary war, which was the battle of Kings mountain in North Carolina. And so that's, Oh, if in the in the perfect world, I finish this documentary, then I make the gospel quartet movie, then I make my revolutionary war movie, and then um, I, I take a little rest. <laughs> Got to take a break. Um, so when you're directing, you're not going to be in them as an actor because that is hard to do. Because how do you keep your focus in front of the camera and behind the camera? Well, usually every film I've done, I have I have acted in too because it's actually. <laughs> It's actually a relief when I have to act in films I, I direct because I don't have to argue with the actor. <laughs> Yell at That's yourself. That's exactly what I want him to do. I don't have to tell him what to do. <laughs> so, it's like, when I, did, I played the d- defense attorney in Gosnell, and those, those three days it was sort of like, okay, whew, now I'm actually doing something that I know how to do. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm just sort of trying to fool everybody into thinking I know what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Is this what you always wanted to do? I mean, can you remember from a young age, hey, I want to be, well, aside from a pastor, <laughs> yeah. did you always want to be an actor or was there something else that you wanted to do or how'd you fall into this business? I think I, I knew pretty much from the time I was about 12 that the, I wanted to be an actor. I, I can remember very distinctly um, sitting in my house watching the Mary Tyler Moore show yeah, and, uh, and thinking, I want to be one of those people. That, that looks like fun. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it really, it was that simple. And then I wound up doing a lot of plays in high school and, and doing a lot of theater in college and all that. And just, but, but it kind of, that set me on the path back then. And, um, it was really fortunate. I wound up doing a couple of episodes of hot in Cleveland. Oh, really? Oh, with Betty White. I yeah. love her. I watch so the I got, Golden I, Girls all the time. <laughs> yeah. I got to tell Betty White that story that, uh, you know, that basically I was, uh, watching her on television and thought, I want to do what they're doing. And then here I, here I was. Wow. Oh, we need to get Betty White on here. She, I love that woman. I, at night, I'm like, okay, let me put on Golden Girls. That's a harmless show. You know, it's fun to watch. And I'm just, I'm laughing all the time. So you're Mary Tyler Moore. I watched Carol Burnett when I was growing up. So that was- oh, me too. Yeah, I love yes. Carol Burnett. Yeah. She did that for me. It was like, oh, I want to do that. What is this show? So yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting. What, who were some of your other inspirations or who, you know, were you just watched- and you said, hey, I want to be like that, or that's my favorite actor or actress. Well, Gene Hackman was always kind of my, I was like, that guy's kind of ugly. I could probably do what he does. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but, but uh, you know, and, and, and I was lucky enough to get to work with Gene. I got Gene and work with him on Runaway Jury and ah. 
it was uh, just, uh, you know. How was, was it? Were you starstruck? Like, oh, that was my idol. Did you tell him that? <laughs> I, worked, I worked with Gene for about eight days on that movie. And the first three days, I was so in awe of him that I really couldn't even speak. I couldn't, I couldn't really look at him. I was afraid to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, and Gene is actually rather shy himself. He's he's almost introverted, and but it got so awkward that finally Gene had to break the ice, <laughs> wow. and, and he started joking with me, and 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 we got along great. But I, I did get to tell him at the end of that shoot that how much he meant to me and how much uh, wow. he had inspired me to to go into it. But That's yeah, Gene Hackman was a huge influence, and and I'd have to say in some ways Tommy Lee Jones too uh, mm -hmm. early on. I had seen a movie called Jackson County Jail with him. Yeah. So same kind of thing. That was one of his first films, I think, with Yvette Mimu or something. It was like yeah. not, not the greatest, not an A-list movie, but <laughs> I just remember watching that film and the same thing. I go, that guy is interesting looking. He's not like a conventionally handsome leading man. And it sort of, that's another instance where uh, I thought, well, maybe I can do this. I don't have to be the best looking guy in the world. <laughs> Those are our best actors. I mean, the character actors, and those are the ones that are memorable. So, yeah. Um, it, you know, this business, it can be very tough. You and I both know Hollywood's tough. The business is tough. But don't you just love what we get to do for a living? We tell stories. We're, we are creators. We touch people's lives. When you see a film or a TV show and it really impacts you, to be a part of that is really rewarding. And I love that you're doing things on your own. You know, we're doing things on our own over here. So we can still do what we absolutely love to do, but we don't have to play their way anymore, which I, I just, in a strange kind of way, ever since this whole, you know, pandemic happened, there's so many more platforms and opportunities now. Um, I, I think it's been a good thing in a way, because I always look at everything in a positive but I, how has that affected you too? Like the whole pandemic, everybody was pretty much shut down. What were you doing during that time? I was flying around the country like some sort of maniac. I mean, we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> we were didn't doing. Stop you. I didn't. I didn't have time to really. I mean, we were flying right in the middle of all the pandemic, and and in some ways, it really was a blessing because you'll see when you when you watch the film. We were able to go to Washington and shoot in places where there was absolutely nobody there. Yeah. It was like we had crowd control or something, but we had the Jefferson Memorial all to ourselves. We yeah. shot in there for three and a half hours, just me and my crew and my my guest in the Jefferson Memorial was uh, Bo Snurdly, was James Golden from the Rush Limbaugh show. We had it, it was like we had a set and we shot on the steps of the Capitol, we shot on the steps of the Supreme Court, Louis Gomert took us inside the, the Capitol building. We were able to shoot in there. And it, we couldn't have done that if it hadn't been, you know, the, the situation that it was, that the, that the yeah. entire town was deserted because of the pandemic. It, it was quite I never thought about that. You are right, because usually you have to get, you know, permits and there's people everywhere. So you that was ideal for you then. That was perfect timing. It was. It really, really was. And, you know, that that's... Uh, I think that what happened to me with that film is uh, it, by forcing us to really just, we got to go shoot no matter what we got to go shoot. And we went, we had completely empty airlines. You know? <laughs> we would, we would be flying on planes and there'd be yeah. like 12 people on the plane. And it you know, in some ways it made it a little bit more, a little bit easier, really. Crazy. Yeah, exactly. That's what you always wish for when you're on a, now you, now you got the whole role, you got the whole plane to yourself. <laughs> So, um, the toughest anything, part was eating out, though. You know, when you're in a town and you're shooting, there's no restaurants open. Right. Yeah. That's kind of hard. <laughs> Pack your own lunches and dinners. Yeah. <laughs> no craft services there. Right. Right. <laughs> Pastor, do you have any questions uh, for Nick? We're, we're running towards the end here. Yeah, we're, we're wrapping it up. Uh, I do know what Nick is working on. And, you know, we can't say what it is. But I'm telling you, you're going to want to watch the next one, too, because this will yeah. be a incredible, incredible thing that he is working on. Uh, absolutely amazing. And I love your patriotism. Uh, I see your flag in the back. Uh, you know, we see our flag in the back. Um, yeah. it's, it's, we're patriots. Pa we're seeing patriots come to Christ and Christians become patriots. It's a beautiful time to be alive right now. 
Yeah, it is. And uh, it's it's amazing, like you were talking about all the coincidences that are happening. They're not coincidences. We're, we're being led. And uh, the fact that Aubrey met you before I met you, and then you're talking to Jason, and then I, Jason knows me. And, and then, you know, this next movie that we're working on, you and I have so many mutual friends that are going to be part of that. Yep. So it really is. I, I think that uh, there is a great convergence here that I think God is orchestrating. And I'm just humbled and proud to be a part of it. And uh, I just hope I can, uh, I hope I can make it funny, you know, because <laughs> it's a very serious subject. But, you know, the, the humor's uh, like Lisa said, the humor's so important right now. And, uh, and the left can't stand ridicule anyway. So it's, it's effective on many levels. Yep. And God wants us to laugh. Uh, he has a great sense of humor. And it's amazing. You know, all that, again, I started the show with, I, I was with a board member and said, there's Nick. I, I got to meet Nick. And <laughs> it was like God touched it at that moment and said, I got a call from somebody that we both know. Uh, he's doing this with this and this person. And then the yeah. Sunday pop up, it, it was all God. You can't explain it any other way. Yeah. <laughs> like we said, Jesus, take the wheel. And he did. He's in control. Yep. He did. <laughs> That's great. Well, Nick, thank you so much uh, for everyone watching. Let's make sure that we support Nick and all of the projects that he does. Um, so America, America, God shed his grace on thee. Uh, check out that documentary and any other films that Nick has got coming up. Um, and thank you to Abraham again for our beautiful uh, song that he sang for us called Quiet Storm uh, at the beginning of the show. And this has just been such a great conversation. It's great to talk to Hollywood people, you know, actors um, that are like-minded, that that have faith and that are on a mission to tell these positive stories. So I'm just, I'm so excited. Thank you, Nick, so much for being here. You, you're amazing. <laughs> it's my pleasure. And thank you so much. I mean, what you guys are doing is so important. And, uh, you know, we, we all have to listen and be led. And um, I'm just... Um, I'm, I'm honored to be part of what's happening. All right. It's, it's exciting. Well, thank you. It's exciting. Thanks again, Nick and Abram, Abraham. Uh, it was just a pleasure having them both on. Um, absolutely, absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. So uh, we're going to close this out with just you and me, Lisa. Um, okay. You want to talk about what we have in the hopper next? Yes, coming up next Wednesday. So we are, uh, his story is every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And I am excited about this next guest that we have coming up. His name is Ron Duguay. And if you are a hockey fan, a sports fan, a New York Rangers fan, you are not going to want to miss this. Uh, so we're going to talk with Ron Duguay, who is a New York Rangers legend, and he has done so much more in his career. He's going to come and talk about that and uh, talk about his faith story. So uh, for all the New York Rangers fans, hockey fans out there, sports fans out there, tune in next week, Wednesday, 2 p.m., Eastern time right here uh, for Ron Duguay. Yep. And we have many, many more coming in. They're coming in fast and furious. Uh, it's amazing, this movement. And they, if people out there are watching, if they have, they know somebody in this neck of the woods, entertainment, sports, uh, whatever that you have connections with, bring them to us because we yeah. want to tell his story. Yep, we do. And I mean, your email, everybody's email is flooded with people coming to us, which is great. So we, uh, it's incredible and amazing what God is doing. And uh, everyone watching, you're going to be really excited uh, because we've got some wonderful guests coming. We'll, we'll kind of, you know, as we go, tell you who's going to be on next. But uh, I can tell you this. There's some big names and it's exciting and uh, God is good. He is at work. So God is good. And there's some that you yeah. don't even know about yet that contacted us before we even came on. Oh, so, okay. There. So you and I will talk after yes. this. Pastor so, <laughs> absolutely beautiful. Continued. The after show. <laughs> the after show. Yeah. We're getting so many of them. It's going to have to be a two hour show. It, you never know. You Whatever never know. Yep. Because uh, people want to hear these, 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 these true stories of a love of Christ, patriotism, and how they uh, have come out of this particular uh, area, whether it be music or entertainment or sports. It's just, it's an amazing thing. God's moving. Yeah. 
He is. And this is so much fun with you. Thank you so much. You're the best co-host ever. And uh, this is it's it's an exciting journey. And I can't wait to see what's next. Well, you got the face for Hollywood. I have the face for radio. So it's a perfect match. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> and I can't sing. <laughs> yes. Jesus creates nothing but beauty. So there you go. We're yeah. all beautiful. And how about that music from Abraham? Oh, my oh. goodness. And yes. we're going to do his testimony, too. His, the, the movie Out of Africa was based on his family. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, so he will, he'll be a great guest. Yeah, I I'll mean, his songs story is much country. bigger than just what he came on and played in the music. It's, I it's love amazing. this. This is great. This is so much yep. fun. I yep. hope everyone at home is enjoying this, too. <laughs> yep. So this was wrapping up our uh, last episode with, with Nick and Abraham. I, I, we pray that this has been a blessing to you. And uh, we'll see you next week. We'll be back. We will. We will be back. God bless everyone and go in his shalom. Because of COVID-19, the air we breathe and the things we touch are no longer safe. Shared air and surfaces harbor risks due to COVID and other pathogens. But with active pure technology, air and surfaces can be purified and disinfected quickly and safely while you share and occupy spaces with others. Active Pure is a patented advanced active form of PCO technology. It works by creating and propelling safe and powerful disinfecting molecules into the air in a room, which quickly seek and destroy pathogens everywhere. Active Pure molecules work by piercing the shell of a virus or bacteria to destroy its living environment, thereby preventing it from replicating or doing harm. Active Pure technology is designed to use the law of gases to carry its safe disinfecting molecules into every nook and cranny in every shared space. The law of gases is the reason that the smell of microwaved popcorn immediately spreads through your entire home. These odorless and invisible Active Pure molecules fly through the air from our portable or installed Active Pure products quickly and safely destroying pathogens in the air and on surfaces. Active Pure is very different from other technologies that take a passive approach and require that the pathogen be pulled into an inefficient filter, UV light, or plain PCO mechanism. Active Pure does not wait to see if by luck the pathogen is captured. It seeks and destroys them quickly, wherever they may be, in the air you breathe or on the surfaces you touch. Active Pure can deliver measurable and guaranteed results, giving you the peace of mind to know that you are providing the best protection for the people you care for. Active Pure technology is used in hospitals, state houses, and other shared facilities across the world. It is proven by science and validated by multiple third parties. Active Pure is not too good to be true. Obey's extreme terpenes incorporate all the vital components of the industrial hemp plant by sourcing organic ingredients from the flowers, seeds, and stalks of these God-given plants. All of our products meet or exceed the 2018 U.S. Farm Bill requirements. Obey is leading the way in restoring past remedies for essential solutions with clean and simple, natural, organic, healthy choices. Thank you for your support as it helps fund many of the His Glory Ministries Benevolence Projects.
He brews coffee by his glory, providing you with the best tasting coffee on the planet.